Dave Foreman. I'm over at University of Colorado. And today I want to talk about this, this big question, this big elephant in the room that, that we've been going over with my staff and in my head for a long time now. What makes a good coach? We all have seen good coaches. We've all seen bad coaches. You kind of know it when you see it. Can you define it? Can you, can you put your finger on it? The people that, that judge us and evaluate us, whether it's sport coaches or administrators, do they, do they even know what we do, right? What makes a good coach? So I have an overview here. I, this is more to keep me on track. I'll talk a little bit about some history in my career arc, uh, kind of explain how I get where I'm at. We'll, defer this we'll define uh, the term coach, talk about different competencies, talk about developmental profile and some ideas for action. So. This is where I grew up. I grew up in Glendale, New York. Uh, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my entire life, um, is a strength coach. In 1995, I was at St. Francis Prep. I actually met a, a guy the other night who went to my high school, which I'm pretty stoked about. Um, so I'm from Queens. This is the street I grew up on. I mean, this is the basketball hoop I learned to play ball on. I was fortunate enough. This is my house, and that's my fire hydrant right in front, so nobody could park there. So my house was home plate base for tag, you name it. We had a whole lot of, this is the amount of space we had, but this is our space. New York City, this is, this is a lot of space. So um, I have no idea where I got this from. I really don't. This was somewhere in 95. Uh, I, I, I think maybe I must have caught a news program where the Nebraska Huskers must have won the national championship again. And maybe they said something about Boyd Epley. And I got this term strength coach, but there was no Google search engine. I couldn't look this up. And I had this idea in my mind, and, and back then, what are you going to major in? You get this big brown book, Barron's book, and you flip through, and it's accounting, and it's all in alphabetical order. There was no exercise science, kinesiology, you name it. So I took a class uh, in elective my junior year called Sports Physiology. There was a teacher named Michael Chiaffa, and really introduced me to a lot of these concepts. I played football, and you know, really, I just wanted to get bigger, faster, stronger. I wanted to get better. I wanted to earn a scholarship, or you name it. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I was looking for guidance. And uh, you know, great book, Simon Sinek, Start With The Why. That's, that's, that's why I do what I do. I, I was a kid who wanted to get better, but didn't know what to do. I would you know, flip through those every muscle and fitness magazine and do whatever Arnold was doing that month and pull out the, f the poster. And I mean, I did some ridiculous programs uh, just because I didn't have any guidance. So, I, um, I ended up going to James Madison University, and that's where I, I played football there. And uh, on my uh, official or unofficial, I don't remember, but, but I spent the whole time in the weight room with Greg Werner, who's a great mentor to me. He's not here at the conference. I wish he was. And um, I, you know, I played ball. I had a kind of unique education, and then I played. We, we had a different football coach come in my freshman year, so I had a, like a football strength coach and Jim Durning, who's now at University of uh, UNC Charlotte. And so I played for Jim, I worked for Greg, I kind of got two different philosophies going, and, and I, I, Greg was really good to me. He let me do a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have done. Uh, let me coach, let me work as a student assistant. He gave me my first job in the profession. I was making seven nineteen an hour, working 20 hours a week. That was a lot of money to me back then. And um, so, so I go to James Madison. Somewhere in my senior year, I don't know what I was thinking, I decided I want to get into the private sector, and if you're a private sector person, I'm not knocking you, it's just, it was very different from kind of my original plan. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go get into the private sector, I want to own my own gym, so I'm going to go work in somewhere in the private sector. So my senior year, I end up uh, applying for all these jobs, and I move out to California, because I want to move to California, I work in the private sector, worked there for about a year, learned a lot, learned a lot of things about functional movement screen and Gray Cook and, and Gary Gray, but I also learned I don't really like the business. So I did everything I could to get back in. Um, during that time, I ended up taking one of those minor league baseball internships, worked for the Detroit Tigers, go down to Lakeland, Florida. I have some measure of experience. I was older than some of the other interns there. They let me have a lot of responsibility. They let me work with the pros, the big leagues. Um, good time. I learned some things. It was a weird time for Major League Baseball back then. There was a lot of uh, kind of hands-off approach. So it was, it was a learning experience, but I can't promise you I learned a different thing. Um, and now it's on me. Somehow I end up as, as uh, I'm working for an energy drink company in Southern California. I don't know how. 
drop everything, and I, I knock on the door with Chris Carlisle. He lets me in as, a, as an unpaid volunteer intern. And that was kind of SC's heyday with, with Pete Carroll and, and, and Reggie Bush and, and, and Matt Leinart. And, um, you know, they let me do a lot there, and, and I kind of, you know, I thought I knew everything. I thought everything they said was gospel. And um, I end up getting a GA position, Old Miss. So I go down to Mississippi, uh, had some kind of mutual connections there, whether it's through USC or from people from James Madison. And I can tell you right here, I was the worst GA ever, ever. I thought I knew everything. I wanted to tell them how it was. Uh, Aaron Osmus was my, uh, was my supervisor. You know, I was trying to tell him how SC did things. I didn't know my role. I, um, we, our weight room was very long. And the way we had it set up was you'd have, you know, all these platforms set up, and, and they would have all the cards for each guy, and they, they'd lay them out. And we had some talent on that roster. We didn't do so well in 2005, but we had, we had Patrick Willis. We had Mike Wallace, Michael Orr. I mean, you name a, a guy in the NFL. I mean, we, we had a talented roster. So these guys were all on these platforms here. And then down there was like, you know, fourth string punter, you know, eighth string quarterback and, and transfer from I don't know where. Dave, you go down there. And I would spend time fighting with the assistants and fighting with my supervisor. Why can't I go over here? Not looking at the opportunity that anybody can coach Patrick Willis. If I can get these guys to function anywhere close that's an opportunity, and I didn't, I didn't see any of these opportunities for what they were. That, that's really what I'm trying to say with all this here. So I think I'm slick. I graduate in a year, um, pull every string in the book. Uh, I basically trick them somehow into paying for my internship at Notre Dame, um, go up to Notre Dame, and I, I worked there for a summer, and I was the worst intern ever, worst intern. I'm, I'm, from the second day, I'm, I'm, I'm checked out, and... Honestly, I wasted three months of, of, of my life in their time, too. A friend of mine, Gary Uribe, leaves USC, becomes a head guy at Sacramento State. I go back to Southern California to try to get his old job, not realizing the, the wake of idiocy I've left. Um, and anyway, Gary calls me up and says, look, I need some help. So he gives me my first full-time gig, making $1,000 a month. I'm up there. I try to help him out at Sacramento State. And this is a friend of mine, and we're very like-minded, and we're, we're, our personalities are very similar. Uh, we're getting into arguments while I'm working there. So I'm the worst assistant now, ever. So I'm at Sacramento State, and uh, my job gets cut. Basically, they can't pay me anymore. So I, I get the pink slip. I end up having to go back home. Live in, we live in New York. And I, I, I catch on in northern Arizona. Um, Rob Schwartz is here somewhere, maybe. Uh, Rob was my boss there. And I was the worst assistant at, at northern Arizona. Um, I'm telling him what to do. I'm not bought into what his, his philosophy is. You name it, I'm arguing with him about how to do this, why not to do this, what about this, this. Um, somehow I get a job at Stanford. And it's 2008, and, uh, you know, right time, right place for me, honestly. Um, it, was, it was just the start of Coach uh, Jim Harbaugh's second season. I'm there with Shannon Turley. He hired me. And here's where things started to change, at least for me. And I'll touch on some of these competencies later. But Shannon can be tough to work for. I'll just put it out there, and I know some of his staff is here, and they know what I'm talking about. It really forced me to look in the mirror and look at a lot of the things I've done and did, and, and whether I knew or didn't know, and forced me to change. Forced me to change. And I didn't always like the methods, and, and it was tough, and, and I think we were going to throw down a, about a handful of times. But it really, and, he, and he, he invested time in me, and I, you know, I just had a conversation with him two nights ago, and I, I can appreciate him now. I didn't appreciate it then, I'll tell you, but, but I can appreciate that now. And so, you know, right time, right place. I'm there until 2010. We win the Orange Bowl. I ride that wave. I get hired uh, at San Jose State by, uh, by Coach Mike McIntyre. It's my first head job. We're there for uh, two years with him, and then he took me to Colorado in my current position. Let's define the term coach. So the, the, the word coach itself, it's a Hungarian derivative from this, this city, uh, Koxi, I guess. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. But it basically means a, it's carriage. It was, it was these guys would, would build a carriage. And it was used in slang terms 
for a tutor at Oxford University. But, but really, at the end of the day, what does it mean? It describes a process of taking people from, from where they are to where they want to be. Right? That's what we do. Right? We try to help them achieve their goals. Uh, John Keogh uh, discusses some of the things coaches must possess, a strong technical aptitude. I think you've got to know what you're talking about. You have to have a, a, a strong knowledge, competency, exercise science, related fields, right? whether it's uh, you know, formal education. The ability to develop a performance culture, an ability to excite and challenge athletes in a daily training environment. So you're looking at motivational concepts there. Really, that's built upon relationships. Okay, so what makes a good coach? What makes a good coach? And I, very informal, this is a wordle I put together, but, but I asked, you know, I, I threw it out there on social media and, and friends of mine and colleagues and different people I'm around, what makes a good coach, right? And you got a lot of terms there and a lot of things people said, but really the biggest one, I don't know if it's as clear as it should be, but teacher. Coaches are teachers, right? Think about how much teaching we do. And it's not just how to squat, how to whatever. It's, it's you know, you're teaching them life lessons and, and, and discipline and, and, and skills that they're going to carry well beyond their athletic career, especially in the college setting, right? So I come across this book, Building a Better Teacher. This is a fantastic book, by the way, by Elizabeth Green. Uh, it's fairly new. And it, it's a great read. It's written very well. And it, there's so many parallels to our profession and teaching profession, it's crazy. Um, it, it, it's a very impressive book. I, I recommend it to anybody. But she talks about teaching. In the United States, the act of teaching is very solitary. It's very solitary. It's, 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 it's one person, you're in there. The, the way education works in, in the United States, basically, you know, you, you go to school, you get a degree in education. I think you take some sort of certification and exam, depending on the state you live in, and boom, you're a second grade teacher. Go. And you, you stand there up in front of a class, like, what's going on? This kid's picking his nose. This kid is eating glue. Uh, you know, it, it, no one really teaches you now how to do it. In Japan, it's very communal. It's very communal. And there's a lot of people involved in, in the development. And um, it's, it's a very systematic thing that they do. It, it's a systematic approach where they really emphasize preparation. They pit, nitpick everything thorough attention to detail in terms of the delivery, the, not just the content, but, but how. I mean, they, they go into examples of math problems, and you're teaching math. What, what exact math problem is going to get the concept across to the kids? So there's a big difference between 10 plus 5 and 9 plus 4, and, and the details there. And I don't want to get into pedagogy and, and math and things like that, but really nitpicking how, how are we relaying content and imparting knowledge. How's it getting from my head to their head? And, and not just to, to one kid's head, but everyone's head, which operates in a different manner. So I'm going slightly off topic here, but this goes back. There's a guy, W. Edwards Deeming was a uh, statistician, uh, market research guy, professor in like the, the 40s. He, he just didn't get very popular in the United States for whatever reason. But and that's, that's our loss, honestly, because he wrote a book and did some consulting in Japan right after World War II. You know, their, their economy was in shambles. Um, you know, we, cha we, we, we were tasked with rebuilding um, Japan after, after, after we, we, we blew it up. And um, they, they ate up everything, everything that he was about. And some of his total quality management, there's 14 points. It's, it's pretty well documented because um, Japan became an industry leader, especially in electronics and technology, cars, you name it. And basically in the 80s, we said, well, they're doing everything better than us. What's going on? And then is when deeming got popular during like the Reagan years. And then we started listening to what, what's going on. But basically, build quality into the product in the first place, institute on the job training, institute a vigorous system of education and self-improvement. So it was this constant feedback loop in their management system and how they're developing their products. And it was, let's think about all these things on the front end and build quality in and not just fix what we break later. That's what was happening with, with American engineering. So he ends up teaching the Japanese this concept of Kaizen, and that's, that's the symbol for it. But basically means continuous improvement. A lot's been made about that in different management books. And, and I just saw one in the uh, airport the other day as I was coming in. But, but getting better every day. Little steps every day get better every day in some way, shape, or form. This concept, 
which I can't pronounce, Jogyo Kenkyu, um, is, is, is lesson study. This is what they do in Japan with their teachers. They'll film class settings, and then afterwards, groups of people and, and, and different colleagues, different teachers in the same setting, they'll get together and go over how you delivered your content, what was said. It, it'd be the same concept of me watching this film later and then trying to improve my public speaking skills and my delivery and, and how I'm gonna get up in, in front of y'all and talk next time. Um, they, they try to walk you through the thought process. Why did you call on that kid? Why did you call on that kid? You know, this kid, this kid always raises his hand and, and knows the answer. Well, me as a teacher calling on that person, when I know that this person maybe isn't getting it, how do I get them to contribute? How do I, all these different methods, discipline, you name it, but basically it's, it's a communal learning setting. It's a communal learning setting. This comes from uh, some research by, by Cote and Gilbert. Uh, Coach, the consistent application of integrated professional, interpersonal, and intrapersonal knowledge. This is going to be key later. To improve athletes' competence, confidence, connection, and character in specific contexts. So these four C's that they talk about. This is what we do. This is what we do, right? Competence, right? Knowledge, skills. We've got to teach them something. Right? We teach them how to squat. Teach them how to power clean. Teach them, teach them whatever. Teach them how to, how to jump. You name it. That, that's competence. Confidence. Got to instill confidence in these kids, a belief that they possess the capability to be successful. Connection is, is it's, it works because it's alliteration, but basically you're looking at teammate relations, bonding, come together as a team. Um, James Smith did a podcast recently with, with Mark Watts on Elite, but basically talked about, um, uh, you know, one of the major things about Elite programs and, and winning programs is that, is that connection, is that connection, finding some way that they come together. I mean, team... Team, by definition, is a series of relationships that come together for a common goal. And then character, and these are the things we try to instill in our kids, typically when they're screwing up, right? Hey, look, what we're, we, there's a reason I get on you when you're late, when you have a job later in life and you're late and fired. Things like that, you know, character, uh, ethical decisions, discipline, accountability. So, these building blocks, and I touched on this earlier, this pyramid here, you're looking at three big things, professional knowledge, Interpersonal knowledge, intrapersonal knowledge. Professional knowledge, again, it goes back to what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Your competencies, your education, your formal and informal education. Your values are your values. That's going to guide everything you do. And, uh, you know, you, th that comes from your upbringing, who you are, how you were raised, uh, different fundamental things that you hold tight to. Interpersonal knowledge is connecting with people, relationships. Relationships. Intrapersonal knowledge is that self-awareness and reflection. Do you even have that comparative? So I venture to say these three, these three qualities are all necessary in, in varying degrees, and you can get away with having extreme in one versus the other and still be a successful coach. I'll say this, going back to my career arc, I thought I had tremendous professional knowledge. I thought I knew everything, right? I thought I knew all the, all the stuff. I didn't even have a concept about interpersonal knowledge. And I didn't even have that self-awareness to look in the mirror and, and realize that I don't know anything. So what I gained being at Stanford, it would mostly be the fact that I was able to then increase my awareness, my self-awareness, be able to reflect upon what I know and don't know, what I need to improve on and, not, and, and, and get better at. And, and I can say right now, I'm not great at the interpersonal knowledge stuff. That's what I need to work on the most. You know, the, the old adage is they don't know how much you know until they, wait a minute, they don't care how much you know until you know how much you care. Did I say that right? But you get the point. I, I'm, I struggle with that. And, and that's what I, I try to improve. So if, if I need to build that part of my pyramid to make me a better coach. But at the, the, the top part is just the different type of athletes you're working with. That middle bar is just, you know, again, some of the things you do on a daily basis and, and, and how these competencies are going to affect that. You know, you set the vision and strategy. We'll call it programming in our aspect. Um, shape the environment, build relationships, conduct the training session, read and react, make adjustments on the fly, right? You know nothing ever goes as planned. And then, and then be able to learn and ref reflect. That's really the key. You don't know what you don't know. And, and I guess you can't be held accountable for that. Naivety is not really like the worst sin, but if you can expand your, your awareness, I think that's gonna help tremendously. This is a great chart here by Patrick Hunt. He's with the Australian Institute of Sport. 
And as you go from the top down, you're, you're working along like a, a career continuum. Beginning coaches, what, what, what is every, I'm, I'm assuming most everyone is, I'm 36, so I'm, I'm young, but I'm not that young. I've been doing this for about 20 years, it feels like. Um, but when you're first starting out, what, what's the first thing? You're yearning for drills, yearning for plays. This is a little more in the sport coach context, but you're, you're building your movement library. Hey, this is a cool exercise. I've never heard of this. Oh, this is a great drill. And, and it's just drills, drills, drills. This ex exercise, exercise, exercise. Then as you start moving along, intermediate, you get into you know, reinforcing detail, coaching on the run. What are different um, cues that I can use in a succinct manner to get what I want? You don't have time to pull everybody aside and start over, and you gotta kinda do things on the fly and run around. How well can you cue? How effectively can you pare down your cue? I had a great conversation with a guy about a month ago, and, and we were talking about motor learning and, and how you learn skills. Now, I don't think that there's an answer to this, but I kind of put it out there as a hypothetical. I said it to my staff, I'll say it to y'all. What's probably one of the more technical lifts you could do? I, mean, I don't know, a, a, a power snatch? Some, some complicated Olympic lift? What if you could cue that in, what if you could teach that in two cues? Now, I don't think you can, but that's impressive. That's, those, those would be two damn good cues, right? As you get into advance, you get into some more other things, you know, detailed information. How do you take a large amount of information and, and impart it to the kids and, and, and kind of tailor it to their skill level and what they can do? You gotta be able to answer some of these questions. How does it transfer to the sport when you get into implementation and, and basically take that movement library and pare it down into what is actually gonna work for me? The art of coaching. It, it, some of this gets into behavior change. Foundations of practice. Practice? Talking about practice. So, um, I'm sorry, I tried. All right, so uh, talking about practice and, and how that all came about in the study of, of practice itself. Uh, in the 1800s, uh, Hart, Brian and Hart, they looked at factory production. They were looking at um, you know, manual labor and, and the ability to, uh, there was a cigar rolling factory and other things, and how well could it carry over if they actually had practice time and were able to uh, basically improve their, their production. Not, about, 100 years later in 73, Simon and Chase, there was, a, there was a classic study about chess masters and Bobby Fischer. And from there they talked about how do you basically become a grandmaster in chess. Talking about 10 year old necessary preparation, proving that nurture is, is, is a lot more prevalent than, than nature so much. Uh, Anders Ericsson really tried to clarify that point looking at deliberate practice. So it's not just amount of time spent doing something, it's, it's, there's intent. There's positive intent to actually gain knowledge and, and, and get better. This got popularized in, in 2008 with, with Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers and, and, and Colvin and Talent is Overrated and, and all these books, this 10,000 hour rule that everybody seems to throw out there and quote. There, there's validity to this. So uh, Duffy and Erickson and Cote talk about the, this 10,000 hour rule, if you will, this experiential profile of coaching. The things that make up you know, your, your experience here. Athletic experience, is it required? No, but it helps, right? Um, especially if you're an athlete, you had exposure to a variety of sports, maybe you were in a leadership setting, you were a team captain, or, or on a leadership council, whatever uh, situation you're involved in. About three to 4,000 hours there. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's in high school, it doesn't even have to be at, at, at the collegiate setting. I'm not saying it's required, but it helps. Just in terms of networking, think about that. I mean, I, I played college football, that's uh, however many guys I played with over the course of four or five years, plus every single coach. I mean, they, network's pretty good. I got the job at San Jose State because I played with the offensive coordinator. Right, that was my foot in the door. I had to interview, and I had some good recommendations, but it helps. Coaching experience then, okay, what do you, you know, what, as you're building that, what, what as you uh, advance from, whether it's coaching other sports, maybe some of us coach youth sports and, and different things, uh, at maybe the high school setting, moving up, assistant coach, maybe at a developmental or an elite level, and then as a head coach. Informal and formal education. This could be, again, your educational background, that professional knowledge we talked about, but there's also a lot of informal settings. Technically, this is a formal setting what we're in right now. We're all here, we're here to learn, we're all here talking to different people, and, and, and there's a, a lot smarter people than me in this building. Coaching different certifications, and then obviously mentors and internships and things you, you acquire. I would venture to say that we, most of our time is spent really 
in informal setting, or it could be, it should be. Every single day, you're in an informal learning environment. Every single day. So yeah, that all together, you're looking at nine to 12,000 hours, and um, the, pr the way that they come about this, they looked at elite coaches and then kind of backtracked. How did you get to be where you are? So putting it together, they said elite level head coach, uh, age 29 and up, average. Uh, little story, back in 2008, we had a pro day. Don Yee was there uh, representing one of our players. When I was at Stanford, Don Yee's an agent, uh, big with uh, NFL head coaches. And I got to meet Don Yee. I had a mutual friend, and I introduced myself. And he, he said to me, and I was, I was having a rough go. And he said to me, he said, how old are you? I said, 29 at the time. He said, 29 to 34, your career is going to take off. And, and I remember that stuck with me, and it, and it did. And uh, it's just kind of one of those things that stick in my head. And I always thought that I was behind the curve because of that time that I spent from graduating to actually getting back in because it was a good four-year gap. And that was, that was part of my problem when I was being a bad GA or being a bad intern. I felt like I was behind, you know. Um, I was a GA at Ole Miss at the time, and there was an assistant who was younger than me, but technically higher up than me. And so I, that's why I was trying to fast track everything, and I just, I, I, I was moving too fast for my own good. So three different types of learning situations, kind of like I talked about, informal and formal. You got mediated, unmediated, internal. Mediated is when someone says, hey, look at this. You know, hey, I'm on the stage. Pay attention here. You know, read this book. Unmediated are the things that you take upon yourself, and they're there. And, and what I'm trying to basically say with the, the crux of this is see the opportunity for what's there. I didn't see any opportunity for what's there. I wasted probably seven or eight years of my career pissing everyone off, destroying whatever network I thought. I was chasing logos. I thought that uh, USC, Ole Miss, and Notre Dame looked good on a resume. Did I learn anything? No. Were there opportunities to learn? Probably, absolutely. I was narrow-minded and had blinders on. Internal, again, is that feedback loop, those things where you say, oh, oh, I could have done that better. The internal, we're looking at different areas for reflection. Studies from uh, Gilbert and, and Trudell, reflection in action. It's, it's that set on the fly. What's going on? Whatever cue I just said didn't really work. I got to come up with another one. That kid didn't quite understand what I said. Whatever I said to him doesn't work for him. And as you're going, your plan's changing in the moment. Reflection on action would be after the day's over. Um, was anyone at the pre-con yesterday, uh, the, the folks from Baylor, uh, Andy Altoff, talked about every day they put together a um, kind of like a, a recap of the day, and, and they take notes for themselves. That's reflection on action. What happened today? Leave a note for myself so next year at the same time I can see what, what went well, what didn't go well. How can we do it better? And then retrospectively reflection on action, which is it's the same thing but on a larger scale. Maybe it's at the end of a season, end of a cycle, end of the summer. How did that go? What, what, what happened? What can we do better? So I have this big novel idea. We're at Salt Lake City. I'm there with, with, with my staff. We were at the, the conference in, um, in May. We're driving back. I'm driving with my assistant, Tony Sandoval, and we're talking about a lot of these things. And what makes a good coach? What can we do? What are some ideas? It's an eight-hour drive. I mean, we were talking about a lot of things. And this, I don't know if this is a novel concept. I don't know, I, I don't know where I pulled this out of. So I said, what if, what if we could stick cameras on ourselves and kind of be able to, you know, see it in, in, in point of view perspective, what's, what's going on? What are, what, are, what are we seeing? So I went and I invested in uh, some GoPros. I think we got four of them. We got some chest straps. And it's like all the coaches were wearing the GoPros, turn them on, just coach. You're not even paying attention to it. Sometimes you got to worry about the angle, what you can see, because you cut guys' heads off and stuff. But we started doing this. And we had an intern at the time who... Um, had been with us for a few months. And he was kind of a quiet kid. He was, he was very green and learning, but, um, you know, just still picking it up. Wasn't, 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 wasn't moving, I guess, as fast as I would have expected. Wasn't developing. We were filming for about a week, and then we'd watch film, just like you watch film, you watch practice film to see how you get better. And what we do is we turn off the sound. And say I'm watching a kid squat or whatever exercise he's doing, and, and you just have that, that view from behind or the side, whatever. We turned the sound off so you wouldn't exactly know who it was, which coach it was. And I'd say to him, what, what are you seeing here? Yeah, I got to ask the right questions. What are you seeing here? You know, and you could tell technical things. You know, these kids have different deficiencies or biomechanical stuff going on. 
and you've seen it all when you have a, a technical lift or anything, you know, there's like seven or eight things you got to clean up and you can't throw seven or eight things at a kid. You got to kind of attack it somehow with one or two cues and, and maybe, you know, get a little better today and then work on that the next time. Where would you start? And that's what we have. Where would you start? What are you seeing, first of all? Where would you start? What, what, would you, what cue would you use? And we run it back again. We turn the, the sound up. Okay, what cue did this coach use? Did it work? Let's see the next set. Let's fast forward till we get to this kid's next set. Was there improvement? And you start thinking about your awareness, and, and, and it's, it's that feedback loop. It's that lesson study. I didn't, I, we were kind of doing it without even realizing what it was. And he improved dramatically in like a week and a half, and he was a lot more confident in his coaching. Uh, you know, we have the, 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 the five-person rule now in, in, with football in the NCAA and Division I, and, and we brought him in as our fifth, and um, it, it was incredible. So, uh, I don't know, some ideas for action, basically. This was, this was a, a, a pretty interesting concept. This is what we're going to do with all of our interns right now. We just got a crop of interns. I'm putting the GoPros on them. I want them to observe sessions. What are you seeing? Do you even know what you're not seeing? taking down notes, things like that. Ron just spoke, and Ron is incredible. And I really have a really deep appreciation for him. The presentation that Ron just gave was part of his Strength Coast basic, basic training course, which I recommend to anyone here. I invested in it, like I said, I'm 35, I'm a director. And it, I think it was like $40, I don't know. But um, it's moved to a different platform. and. This is notes from his third or fourth module, and it's basically etiquette for conducting a site visit. Very thorough. He's been doing this for years. Where he got this from, I have no idea, and it's, it's impressive because, God, if I, I would be so much better if I had done these things eight years ago. But, you know, you go, and I, I have people come visit us all the time. I visit other places all the time, and, like, and, it, and I recommend it because it's an informal learning situation, and it's, it's unmediated, but you go talk to different people, and you get to network, et cetera. But what are you looking at? So, so he has this list. It's almost like a form to kind of look at. Okay, go, you go in with, with clear goals and objectives. What, what is this person's philosophy? What does the, their training session structure look like? You know, what's their staff like? D different things of, of how they run their operation. Okay, a lot, and this is great stuff. A lot of this is, is the what, the what and the why. I would say expand that out to the how. So, now I get people come up, they come visit on a Monday, and I mean, I don't know what's going through their head. Oh, they squat on Monday. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure, uh, everyone here squats, right? We all squat, so everyone squats. How do they squat? How does this person coach the squat? How do they cue different things? Is the, again, is the cue being responded to? Do they, are they saying it in a certain way? Oh, I've never thought of that before. That seems very effective. So open up your, your Awareness, I guess I would say, your, your perception of awareness. So it's not just the what, it's the how. And that's that art of coaching and watch other people in, in, in the field. Communities of learning. Yesterday, I got in a conversation with, with again, the Baylor folks, with Josh Nelson. Again, if you're in the pre-con, it was fantastic. And um, communities of learning would be being around like-minded individuals, and, and create these situations where you can bounce ideas off each other and talk in a constructive way. I, you know, this is all I've wanted to do, and, and I'm probably going to say something. I hope I don't piss any of the older folks off. But, and I don't know where it's from, but it seems like in this profession, we all hate each other. We all talk. We all want everyone's job. And, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's like dog eat dog. And, and I don't know why it's like that. It, it, I, it is, sort of. I hope it's not. I would say this. Get around people. Meet people here. Everyone does the business card dance. Actually start to make connections and have conversations with people and try to form the, the YSCC, which they, they did uh, the, the round table. That was amazing. I don't know how it ended up in my inbox in 2008. I don't know why they picked me or if it was just off of a mailing list. But Adam Fight, Megan Young, Danielle Boucher, Andy Altoff, and there might be other contributors that I'm, I'm, I'm neglecting and I'm sorry. But they created this newsletter, and it was the, it was the Young Strength Coaches uh, Coaching Association. It used to be they dropped the A, but um, and it's been up and down in different different iterations. Back they're back with Twitter now. Great Twitter. It's a community of like-minded people that are trying to just impart knowledge and talk and, and open up discussion. 
I, I, um, I tried to open up a, a group site. I, I've had to reformulate it, but um, people get together, constructive criticism, throw out ideas. We started posting some of these videos up. Hey, what do you think about this? And, and so they bring up this concentric circles and different people around you. So you have your, your staff and the people you're around every day. That would be your, your inner circle. But think about your outer circle as it expands, you know, whether it's uh, different age groups, different uh, experience levels, and, and talk and share information. And they, on that Twitter feed, someone just posted, uh, I think it was Adam, posted a letter uh, to, to uh, coach begin their career. I just read it last night. I had to update the slide. But it's by Vern Gambetta. I recommend reading it. It's a quick read. Um, again, you can find it on that Twitter feed. And it, it's advice. It's advice to young person starting as a coach. And I wish I had that. I wish I would have read that. And I wish I had people or even had the awareness to know that I didn't know anything. And I go talk to somebody and learn more and a lot, be a lot more open. Be a lot more open.